May the 24th of 2022 was when Uvalde happened. Uvalde happened where there was a mass shooting at an elementary school, and it really bothered me. All murder bothers me, but children. I told Tanisha, I said, this, this one it is really, really, really irritating to me. It's bothering me. And if you were here back then, I addressed it publicly and said, we need to do everything we can to stop evil, but evil will find innovative ways to be evil. That was May the 24th of 2022. June the 24th of 2022 was the Roe versus Wade decision overturning abortion rights. And there was many protests and people upset. I want you to notice the dates. May the 24th, 2020, there's Uvalde. June the 24th, 2022 is the Roe versus Wade overturning. July the 24th, of 2022, my wife walks in the room and says, I'm pregnant. Okay? So for eight months, God allowed me to witness our unborn son being knitted in the womb. So in real time, I was able to see each week what is happening on the inside of my bride. Each ultrasound I was able to see how it changed from a splat to having a heartbeat to having arms and having limbs eight months ago before ever coming to this particular moment in time then in November of 2022 I said I'm just feeling this burden to speak about abortion I said it's, it's not just the point God was saying, no, this is a whole sermon. I, I want you to have my heart on this. Because my people don't see how the trap of sexual immorality is leading to them to even consider abortion. So I, I want to pray, and I feel real spiritually authoritative on today. Because I'm going to speak God's heart, not Jerry's opinion. Okay, so Father, in this moment, we recognize that you're awesome, that you're a sovereign Father, the Alpha and the Omega. We honor you for being our eternal King. Thank you for allowing us to come together and just feast on your word. Now, God, we are asking that you rebuke the enemy, the devourer, the liar, the accuser that will cause for anybody to be so overwhelmed with condemnation right now that they won't hear and won't recognize that they are forgiven. God, I pray that you give me a divine anointing to be spiritually persuasive, to cause for anybody under the sound of my voice who's considering or possibly, possibly pondering ending a life, let this sermon be so piercing and convincing that they won't go through with it. In Jesus' name, we're asking that you do it. And everybody who agrees with that prayer, would just shout in the room, amen. amen. So I'm not going to be before you long, but I'm going to be extremely strong on th this afternoon. And I must caution you, church family, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, this has been one of the most weighty sermon prep weeks that I have ever experienced throughout my ministry tenure. On Thursday night, I just closed my laptops. I said, I don't wanna take any more notes. I don't wanna see any more data. I don't wanna look at any more ultrasounds. I don't wanna hear any more research. I don't wanna have any more to do with this because this is causing for me to feel some type of way in my spirit. And I ran out of the bathroom two in the morning and just held on to my wife's stomach. Holding on to her stomach, and I kid you not, as I'm holding on to her stomach, I feel Josiah like kicking me in the head. He's either kicking me, kneeing me, pushing me, which makes me cry even harder because my unborn son is actually saying, I feel you, daddy. Whatever that, that pushing is against mama's stomach, I feel it. Back up. I'm crying and I'm holding on to my wife's stomach and she says, I know it's weighty. 
I know the mantle that you have is weighty. But Jerry, God is going to give you the grace to say what it is that he wants you to say. She's rubbing my back and saying, I understand that this is heavy. I understand that this is weighty, but you must be obedient. God, give him the grace to say what it is that you want him to say. And she's praying over me. I just want to pause real quick. Any man can lay with a woman, but when you can get one that can pray for you, when you can get one that can cover you in the spirit, when you can get a woman who can help you go to war in the spirit, when you can get a woman who can help lift the mantle of something that's heavy, when you get a woman a bride that y'all both can double team and tag team hell together. I publicly honor you, Mrs. Flowers. For the world sees this, you see behind the scenes. She kept rubbing my back and rubbing my head and saying, God's going to give you the grace to say what it is that he wants you to say. So I unapologetically and boldly stand before you on this afternoon, and I'm going to say what it is that God has told me to say. And I'm not trying to scratch ears. I'm not trying to get likes. I really do believe this week for a brief moment. For a fraction of time, God allowed me to feel his heart on this. Similar to how David was a man after God's own heart, I really do feel in that moment God was allowing me to feel his heart so that I could preach it with boldness and conviction. Now, I understand that this particular sermon, it is a warfare sermon. This, this particular sermon, I understand it's not going to be the easiest to digest. I understand that it's going to come with unfollows. I understand that it's going to come with people clicking unsubscribe. I understand that it's going to come with dislikes. But let me give you this announcement. I don't preach for the affirmation of man. I'm not looking for an applause. If you need affirmation and applause from men, their boos and criticism will feel like heartbreak. I don't preach for the affirmation of men. I was affirmed in the shadows. I was affirmed in my wilderness season. I received and I believed God's thoughts about me before you ever had one. Did y'all hear what I just said? I received and I believed God's thoughts about me before you ever had one. I was affirmed in the shadows. When I'm walking up and down this aisle, Herbert, back in 2015, and I'm vacuuming in the sanctuary, and I'm removing gum underneath the pews, and I'm changing ceiling towels and wiping urine off the floors in the bathroom, I was affirmed then. I was affirmed before anything ever went viral, before anybody ever knew about the ministry, before anybody ever heard a Jerry Flowers sermon. I was affirmed in the dark. I was affirmed then. I was affirmed before I ever preached my first sermon. So for me to stand before you and preach sugar because I can't handle the thunder of criticism, that's not my disposition. I don't preach sugar. I preach salt. Now, now hear me. This, this is the problem with Western Hemisphere Christianity. This is the problem with the America church. We have been binging so many sugar-coated sermons that when you hear one that has salt in it, it tastes like judgment. We have been consuming so much sugar that when you get a sermon that has salt in it, it tastes unbiblical. But I want you to see what Jesus says about this. You don't have to turn there. I just want you to see it. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, Jesus said, you are the salt. You are the salt of the earth. If the salt loses its saltiness, how will it be salty again? It is now made for nothing but except being thrown out and trampled under the feet of men. So saltless preaching produces nothing. Saltless preaching does not help you change. Saltless preaching does not bring us to repentance. Saltless preaching does not cause for us to run to the feet of Jesus. We have been consuming so much sugar here in America that we have spiritual cavities. We can't even consume meat. Our spiritual teeth aren't even strong enough. We need milk. 
Somebody say salt. salt. It says you are the salt of the earth. Sermons that have salt in it brings your flavor out. Anytime something doesn't have flavor, you put salt on it. And what was on the inside starts to come out because salt was on it. When you go to your job, you should be so salty. You should be so salty where a kingdom flavor comes out. In your marriage, you should be so salty that a kingdom flavor comes out. In your ministry or community, you should be so salty that your kingdom flavor comes out. We need salt. I've learned how to enjoy the rain. Therefore, the thunder of criticism doesn't shake me. The thunder, I've learned how to suffer for his name's sake. Listen, I'm 10 toes deep in this kingdom agenda. Suffering, that doesn't scare me. I'm not scared of a council culture. I was affirmed before they ever tried to counsel or cancel anything. So most of the time, what we're hearing in our churches on today is a cute version of Jesus. But I preach the kingdom agenda. I preach out of my rooted and deeply love for Jesus. I preach so that the loss can be found. I preach so that the prodigals can come back home. I preach so that the curious could come taste and see. I preach so that we could have repentance in the body. Most of the time, our churches want to preach to you a cute version of Jesus. Jesus is my homeboy type of Jesus. But I'm going to preach today that dangerous version of Jesus. I'm talking about that dangerous side of Jesus that got him killed. That side of Jesus. I'm talking about the side of Jesus where if you preach this accurately, they would stone you or kill you. That side of Jesus. I'm talking about the type of Jesus that if we were to allow him to grace our pulpits, many pastors would never invite him back. Because his message would contradict the pastor's agenda. Clear out churches. If Jesus could preach in our churches on today... I'm talking about that dangerous Jesus, that version of Jesus that will flip over tables in our lobbies. That's more about a church brand than the Great Commission. I'm talking about that Jesus, that dangerous Jesus that will flip over these royal chairs that be in pulpits, that have pastors acting as though they're celebrities and mini stars instead of ministers. And they care more about gaining followers than making disciples. I'm talking about that Jesus. That, that, that dangerous Jesus that will flip over tables that's more about church growth than church health. That, that dangerous Jesus. I'm talking about that Jesus that will flip over tables of notoriety that don't have humility. This is why we had a whole segment in this Trap House series entitled Trapped by Triggers. Because God wants to redeem the way you respond. Please hear me. Humility helps you deal with humidity. Humility helps you deal with humidity. When life gets hot, the Holy Spirit keeps me cool. I'm talking about that dangerous Jesus that will frustrate those who love titles but hate trenches. That Jesus. I'm talking about that dangerous side of Jesus that will frustrate those who are gossiping and bad-mouthing about somebody else's sin who went public. Bad-mouthing those who we know their sexual sin, but if truth be told, many of us did the same thing. The only difference is yours wasn't on the shade room. The only difference is yours wasn't recorded and uploaded to OnlyFans. The only difference, y'all don't want to talk to me. Well, preach against somebody's sex tape and you did the same thing, just it wasn't recorded. That, that Jesus. 
that dangerous version of Jesus that will frustrate racists who claim to be Christian, that will frustrate bigots and frustrate sexism, that dangerous side of Jesus that would frustrate injustice judicial systems who say on our money in God we trust and have a Bible in a courtroom that we will put our hands on it to say the truth, but we don't have biblical-based principles to render equality when it comes to verdicts. That Jesus... That dangerous version of Jesus that will frustrate the spirit of religion that wants us to look free instead of actually be free. Any place that does not traffic in the love of Jesus. Any house that claims to be a church that does not traffic in discipleship and building up one another and loving each other and teaching them sound biblical principles and sound doctrine. That is not a church. That is a business. That is not a church. That is a cult. And our biblical ignorance is a funnel for the false prophet to make profit. Bars. I didn't come to play today. We want a cute version of Jesus. I understand that this will ruffle many feathers. I understand that. And I want to be crystal clear about this. I am not speaking or referring to my sisters who have already had abortions. Not speaking to you because the blood works. And Jesus' blood can forgive all sins. The only sin in the text that is unforgivable is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. So I want, to, I want us to see good news in Acts chapter 13, verse 38. The Apostle Paul says it this way. Therefore, my friends, I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Through him, some people. Through him, good people. Through him, everyone who believes is set free from certain sins. The not as bad sins. Every sin and justification you were not able to obtain under the law of Moses. For those that don't understand what justification means, it's just as if I didn't do it. I think we need to pause real quick. And how about let's give, let me finish, let's give God a justification praise. I'm giving, hold on, wait, wait. I'm going to give God praise for all of the stuff I have done, but that through the power of his blood, it's just as if I didn't do it. How about let's give God a praise for that. Now, depending on what you've done, your praise will be a little more radical. Depending on some of the choices you made, your praise will be a little more radical because by the blood of Jesus, it's just as if I didn't do it. As far as the east is from the west, just as if I didn't do it. So I want to set the record straight. As you hear this message, I'm not speaking about those who already did it. Because by the power of the gospel and the blood of Jesus, it's just as if I didn't. I'm speaking to those that are considering it. I'm speaking to those who will consider it. I want to be a voice this afternoon for the voiceless. So there's this familiar passage of scripture. We have a lot of scriptures that we're going to go through on today. There's a familiar passage of scripture. Depending on where we are. In our Christian journey, you've heard it before, but I want us to go to Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5. God gave me a profound revelation that I know was from him. I feel as though I'm smart, but this was too brilliant for me to say, yeah, I came up with that. No, this was all God. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5. If you're there, shout, I got it. It says, before. Somebody say before. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before, emphasis, before you were born, 
sanctified you. Sanctified means to set apart. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Somebody say ordained. ordained. Okay. The word ordained, the root word in ordained is order. Okay. The word ordained in the Hebrew is asa. It means to place in position, set in order, or to regulate. One more time. Ordain, the root word is order, and ordain in Hebrew is asa. It means to place in position, set in order, or to regulate. So in other words, God is saying to Jeremiah and to all of us, before your mother ever took a pregnancy test, before she ever discovered that she was pregnant, there was a position I already placed you to have in the earth. There was something that you were supposed to set in order before she ever missed her cycle. Before she even thought, could I be pregnant? There was something, Jeremiah, that I ordained for you to regulate. Now watch this. So the mind-blowing revelation that God gave me was tell my people that life does not start at conception. Life starts at ordination. <laughs> Hear me. Life does not start at conception. Life starts at ordination. Before you discovered that you had life, that life was already ordained. Is this making sense? Now, I want to give you biblical passage after biblical passage to corroborate my claim. This is not just a clump of cells and a clump of DNA, nor this, this is an ordained woman or, or an ordained man that I ordained before you ever were even aware that you were carrying them. See, many of us are caught up. What about the transportation unit? That's your parent. What about the way we got here? I ordained them before the transportation unit ever met you. Parents are transportation units. Many of us are bitter over transportation units. I ordained you before they even met. I just needed two transportation units to get you here. You're caught up with the transportation. I want you to think about the ordination. Life doesn't start at just conception. It starts at ordination. Let me give you Bible on this where you can see this. Judges chapter 13, verse 3, it says, An angel of the Lord appeared to her. This is Samson's mama. Listen to this language. The angel of the Lord appeared to her and said, You are barren and childless. Did y'all catch that? This means there is nothing in your body. Okay? Listen. You are barren and childless, but, are, but you are going to become pregnant and give birth to a son. Now see to it that you drink no wine or other fermented drink and that you do not eat anything unclean. You will become pregnant and have a son whose head is to never be touched by a razor because the boy is to be a Nazarite declared to God from the womb. He will take the lead in delivering Israel from the hands of the Philistines. The angel of the Lord is telling her about Samson's ordination, and she's currently barren. No child. Life doesn't start at just conception. It starts at ordination. Now, I want you to go down to verse 12. I'm, I'm going to read this one verse from the King James Version, okay? Listen at what Manoah said. This is, this is Samson's dad. Listen at what Manoah says. Verse 12 in the King James Version. And Manoah said, Now let thy word come to pass. How shall we order? Nobody caught it. How shall we order? Order. Take it back. Take it back. Ordain. Root word is order. In Hebrew, ordain means to place in position, set apart or set in order or to regulate. So Manoah is such 
a kingdom-minded man where he's praying, God, how shall we come in agreement with the order of this child? What if, instead of thinking this will ruin your life, instead of, we may not work out, what if instead of thinking, I don't have enough money for this, we pray, God, help me come in agreement with what you have ordered. What if we had a Manoah type of perspective? This child has orders. Now help me to come in alignment with what you have ordered. Not what am I going to do? How are we going to look? How am I going to take care of this? What if we really, really prayed, God, I want to come in agreement with the order that this child has been ordered to carry out. I understand the transportation unit and I, we currently have beef. I understand the way I got this child is not the way that I expected to get it. But God, what is the order that you have so that I could come in agreement with your orders for the child's life? Genesis chapter 17, verse 19. I'm going to drive this point home so that we can see it. This is Abraham really speaking to God about Ishmael and And his child, listen what God says. Genesis chapter 17, verse 19. It says, Then God said, No, Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant, and with his descendants after him. God is telling Abraham about the ordinance of Isaac, And Sarah is not even pregnant. Life does not start at conception. It starts at ordination. I'm going to give you more Bible so that you can see this. Luke chapter 1, verse 11. It says, Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of the incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will Rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the eyes of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He will bring many back, many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will. Are y'all seeing this language? He's talking about John the Baptist, and Elizabeth is not even pregnant. He's saying he will do this, and he will be this, and he will because life does not start at conception. It starts at ordination, and whenever you find out that you're carrying a child, allow your prayer to be, God, this child has been ordered. It's been ordered. So how do I have a Manoah-type prayer and come in agreement with the order That you have for this child. Luke chapter 1 verse 41. It says, when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby. I want you all to take emphasis on this, okay? When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And a loud voice she exclaimed, blessed are you. Among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. The word baby in this particular context is not a specialized word for the unborn. The word baby does not denote zygote or fetus, it is baby. In Greek, it's prephos. So he said, okay, the prephos jumped on the inside of me. Now, to, to better corroborate my claim, I want you to see Luke chapter 2, verse 16. This is speaking of Jesus. It says, so they hurried off and Mary and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. Pause. The baby in Elizabeth leaped. Okay. Luke chapter 2, the baby is laying in the manger. Are y'all seeing this? 
God's view of it is baby in the womb, baby out of the womb. Prifos in the womb is still prifos outside of the womb. Everything John the Baptist was going to be, he already was before Elizabeth was ever pregnant. Everything Jesus was going to be, he already was before Mary ever discovered that she's going to be with child. I could go even deeper with you. The lamb was slain before the foundations of the world. Because life does not start at conception. It starts at ordination. Now, science has not made this harder to believe. It actually has made it easier. Let me give you some hard, cold facts. The CDC reports in the year 2020, we had 620,373 abortions here in America from 1975 to 2012, we had over 1 million abortions a year. We have had, here in America, 63 million abortions since 1973, Roe versus Wade. 63 million. This is not just Jerry's perspective. This is facts. And this is just the ones we know about that are legal. Now let's go a little deeper. The estimated, a pop, the estimated population here in America is 332 million. Out of 332 million, 63 million were killed in the womb. You know what that means? That's 19% of our population. Why are we talking about this in the church? Are we scared of an offering? Are we scared of an unfollow? Are we scared? God's heart on this is, this hurts me. This hurts me. That is 19% of our population. 620,373 abortions in the year 2020. That is 11.2% out of 1,000 women. Why are we silent on this? Why is this? Don't talk about that. Make, make me laugh. Preach something that's inspirational. Makes, why aren't we talking about the 19% of our population that didn't have a chance to carry out their orders? Science has not made this harder. And what God was telling me is, listen, the greatest travesty is when the womb has become one of the most dangerous places for a child to seek shelter. And I have orders for this child. 63 million? But one nation under God, liberty and justice for all. Not 63 million, though. According to the Center of Disease Control and Prevention, 43% of all American women will have an abortion before 45. 20% of them will be teenagers. And 50% of women who had abortions already had one before. 50%. Because an abortion sets forth an, a, a pattern. There's a pattern of when your marriage gets hard, abort it. When the ministry gets hard, abort it. When you don't like what your boss said, abort it. This is not my opinion. This is facts. Now, the vast majority, y'all had to study this all week. It was hard for me to even study it. The vast majority of abortions, if you want facts, 93% of all abortions happen between the 7th and the 15th week. This is when the heartbeat is already there. The baby can already respond to pricks and recoil. The organs are there. The brain is functioning. The heart is pumping. The liver is producing blood cells. The kidneys are cleaning fluid. Fingerprints are already there. The genetic code of this unique man or woman is unquestionably human. 
already. I want us to see this. This is how a baby looks at 13 weeks in the womb. 13 weeks. The baby is moving. We can see arms. We can see legs. That's just a clump of cells though, right? And 93%, 93% of abortions happen between the seventh week and the 15th week of pregnancy. God says it this way in Psalms 139, verse 13. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. What you are seeing behind me is a child being knit together. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full and well. When the disciples were trying to stop children from coming to Jesus, Matthew chapter 19, verse 13, I want you to see this too. Then people brought little children to Jesus for him to place hands on them and to pray for them. But the disciples rebuked them. Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. This is not going to be the easiest, likable, shareable sermon that you ever hear. But it's going to save an ordained man. And it's going to save an ordained woman. And far be it from me, if I call myself a leader and a shepherd to God's people, but I won't touch the hard topics. i got to share God's heart on it. And it's going to get even harder. God told me this in prayer. You need to do this sermon to prevent the millions of ordained women and the millions of ordained women who are not being allowed to carry out their assignment. Do it for them. As a former prefos, as a former baby in the womb, I oppose abortion. And so does God. If you are able to hear this message, you used to be a prefos. It's my body. It's my choice. No human has two heads. No human has, two, has four arms. No human has four legs. No human has 20 fingers. No human has 20 toes. So how are you saying it's your body when there's another body in your body? When you walk into an abortion clinic... Three things die in you that day. Your child, God's plan for the child, and your peace. Three things die that day. We're we're getting God's heart on this. God told me this. All this stuff was hard for me to even put down. God said, okay, I need them to understand an abortion is when an ordained man or woman gets a death sentence due to somebody else's choices or due to them not believing that I will be Jehovah Jireh for that child. That's what an abortion is. An abortion is to interfere with an ordination ceremony. They don't believe that I will be Jehovah Jireh. This could have happened through infidelity. This could have happened through You cheating on somebody. This could happen through fornication. But that child still has an ordination before you met the transportation unit. Because life does not begin at conception. It begins at ordination. The reason I'm confronting this so hard is because the enemy is using it. And the trap that the enemy is using, you know why we're addressing this so hard? 87% of abortions come from the unmarried woman. 87%. 1.7% of abortions are due to medical complications. That's a rarity. And 1% of abortions come from incest and rape. That's 1%. 
This is not my opinion. This comes from the National Center of Biotechnology Information, the CDC, Taurus Force, cited by Physicians for Reproductive Choice and Health Institute of an overview of abortion in the United States of America. I preach to a generation that will pause and Google. Google it. I had to. I'm giving you facts. And this is just the ones that were reported and were legal. So 87% of abortions come from the unmarried woman. Now, I'm going to add this. 87% of abortions come from the unmarried woman and unmarried man. I'm like, okay, let's stop having these conversations about abortions and only talking about her. Right? When it's you as the men that are saying, get rid of it. Not prefos, not ordained child, not life, it. The median cost for an abortion is $550. You couldn't pay for dinner through the relationship, but you will cash that $550. You will PayPal, Vimeo, don't mess with me, to get rid of it. Why are we talking about just her when we are the ones that are driving her to the abortion clinic and staying in the parking lot and saying, I'll be here when it's done? Boyfriend, side piece, baby daddy, one night stand, whatever transportation unit you want to say. See, this is the thing about men. We love the baby making process, but we hate the baby raising responsibility. We hate that part. Couldn't get a dime from you in the relationship. But you got 550 to get rid of it. She's not doing this on her own. You helped her. You helped her conceive this. Now, I, I, I do understand this message, the non-Christ follower is going to hate it. Matter of fact, go a little deeper. The Christian, the proclaimed Christian, that treats the Bible as though it's an elective. We'll just omit this part, skip this part, because proclaimed Christians who treat their Bible as a copied and pasted version, you copy the part you agree with, uh, I leave that part I, I don't like. You, you, you're already going to be upset with this because people who want to do what they want to do can't stand for you to tell them what God said we should do. This is for those who view the Bible as the breathed word of God, who, who view the scriptures as the logos, the rhema, the highest authority in your life. What is God's thoughts on this? I understand you have thoughts, but what are God's thoughts? Maybe this is for you to encourage a sister who's going to call you in a few weeks and say, I'm thinking about getting rid of it. He is no good. And you might just need some biblical scriptures where you could go back, listen to this part, and say, hey, check out this sermon. Hey, check out these scriptures so that you could challenge a sister to stop thinking as though she has the right to determine who could walk in their ordained authority and who can't. Maybe this is for you, sir. To tell your boy who said, man, she late. I'm going to tell her to get rid of it. I need to cash at this. This might be for you to say, no, you love the baby making process. Now it's the baby raising process. That is an ordained child. Those who don't view scriptures as the highest authority, I understand you're already going to have a problem with it. Jesus says it, well, scripture says it this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. You can't convince me that intentional inducing abortion glorifies God. I want to say this too, for the person that's willing to drive across the country because your state no longer supports abortion. If you would drive that far to commit murder, how much more do you think 
you can get on your knees. That's not as far as those hundreds of miles it is to drive to that state that will legally perform it. You could just get on, get on your knees and say, God, I have a Manoah type of prayer. Help me to order this child in the way that you have ordained. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So therefore, we can come to this conclusion from this text. If it's not your body, then it's not your decision. Hmm. It's easy, easy to say, my body, my choice, when it's not your body or your choice if you live or die. Proverbs 6, verse 16. says, these are the six things the Lord hates. Seven that are detestable to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood. What's God's perspective? I hate it. Why do you hate it, God? I had plans for that. Your body's not yours. I'm using your body for an order. Even in the wrong, I know how to turn what the enemy meant for evil. I know how to work it for good. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19. This day I call heaven and earth as a witness against you that I have set before you life and death, blessings and cursings. Now choose life. Why? So that you and your children may live. How much more Bible do you need? This is God's perspective. With your choices, there's life and there's death. I'm telling you to answer, Keto. Choose life. So that you and your children may live. This, this trap is starting with sexual sin. 87% of abortions come from the unmarried woman and the unmarried man. Notice how much evil orbits around sexual sin. Human trafficking, prostitution, rape, molestation, incest, all of it around sexual sin. So no wonder the enemy will use the sexual sin. Let me put it in Bible terminology. 87% of those who fornicate. We don't like that word, I know. I know. Our generation, we have different sayings for it's getting cheeks or clapping them cheeks, shooting the club up, whatever you want to say. We always try to make it sound softer. We, it just sounds worse if you say, hey, bro, I'm going over there to fornicate. Sounds worse. It sounds better to say I'm about to go get them cheeks. I shot the club up last night. Someone's like, what in the world is that? Don't Google it. Images will pop up that will take you to pornographic sites. We, we, we try to sugar. We try to water down. What it really is. 87% of those who engage in fornication. This would talk about a kill the mood. How about the next time before y'all have sex? You look at this man and say, hey, after we fornicate. <laughs> y'all laughing, I'm serious. I mean, his erection was, woo. <laughs> Ask him. I say, hey, um, after we fornicate, if I get pregnant, will you help me raise the child? Now, some men are so scandalous that they will say yes just to get it. I don't apologize. My generation requires real, and so are the generations after me. But I just wonder if you were to say, after we fornicate, not after we have an affair, after we commit adultery, we like to sugar it. 87%. Of abortions come from fornication. 
And I begin to wonder, okay, if 87% come from fornication, 1.7% come from a medical complication, and 1% come from a rape or incest, what about the 11.8% of people who are married? So I started to dig a little deeper, and I discovered that it's due to the wife having an affair or having adultery, doesn't want her husband to find out, or watch this, they are on bad terms already, and she says, if we're going to divorce, I'm not going to raise your child. Since we're not going to stay together, I'm not going to keep this anyway. Mary, Mary, if you're going to be sorry, I'm going to make sure my child doesn't have a sorry father like you. So not only will you kill and hurt God's heart, you're also saying verbiage to hurt that man. Because on the other side of the coin, there are men who say, keep him. And women who say, no. And the man is saying, I don't believe in this. I will be here. But she is so selfish and caught up in her own will that she will say, I'm not keeping it because you're like this. So a curveball the Lord gave me. All abortions aren't due to just relational toxicity. Some are due to perception. So I want to drive this part home really hard. Point number one, the church doesn't do well with prodigals. The church does not do well with prodigals. Old school churches would have a chair, put it in front of somebody's sin who went public as a form of judgment and them repenting publicly. Now, we don't like to take blame for this, but me being a leader in the church, I'm addressing it. Some people are having abortions because it's better for me to kill the child privately than the church murder me publicly. There are certain things that you'll do for one group, but you won't do for other groups. The church does not handle prodigals well. What will pastor say? What will my mama think? What will, what will the, the choir members think? What if the church had a reputation of loving and covering when other people did the same things we did? See how we did? Now listen. What if the same way you gave diapers to that married couple who had a baby, that 17-year-old girl who got pregnant in high school, we gave her diapers too? Are we rewarding the sin? No, we're not. But we're covering the prodigal. Maybe the reason people won't come back is because the prodigal is not with open arms, not welcoming you back, not welcoming the lost and found. You become the latest gossip on the church calendar. And the looks of judgment, the looks of disappointment from people who did the same thing. I, I never, I never maybe marry a woman with kids. Bro, the last four girls you were with, you paid for their abortions. Look down on a sister because she's pregnant. Oh, she did out of wedlock. You would have five kids if you didn't abort yours. How is it we catch amnesia when it comes to our history, but then all of a sudden we have stones when we see somebody else's? If the church had more grace for those whose sin went public, because some of us is private. But if we had more grace for those who went public, I wonder how many children will be born. Because I know I have a place and a community that even though it was wrong, they will love me, they will cover me, they will support me. I won't have to do this on my own. I gave this illustration to minister's class and to our men's conference. I said, this, this woman, Susan Sampson, she, she had this issue with Dasani bottled water. She opened it up and there was moth larva on the inside of it. 
So she contacts Dasani and says, hey, there's moth larvae on here. He says, go check the other one. She checks two, three, four. Every bottle has moth larvae underneath it. And so now the Dasani people say, we're not really going to do nothing. We apologize. Here's a gift card for you. You can go get some more water. I don't want more water. I want my money back, and I want somebody to do something about this. She contacts Coca-Cola. Now the story has reached the local news. And she said, okay, y'all water is nasty. You have moth larvae underneath it. So Coca-Cola does a thorough research, and they discovered the type of larva that was underneath the cap was an Indian meal moth larva. And at their manufacturing companies, that particular larva doesn't even live in that region. Doesn't even live in that region. So they said, okay, this didn't come from us. Go check your storage. So as she checks the storage, she sees that there's a moth nest in the corner. What if the church, the living water is not bad, it's just we have a lot of larvae. The water is good, but we're preaching larva. Our love is like larva. And it's causing for people to not even want to consume the living water because of your larva. The church doesn't handle prodigals well. Number two, this is the main reason I discovered from research. I'm not ready. The child will ruin my life. Second reason on why abortion happens. I'm not ready. The child will ruin my life. Meaning, I can't afford the baby. I don't want to be a single parent. Let me give you a statement I want you to never forget. Obeying God will never ruin your life. In this life and the next. Obeying God will never ruin your life. God has an ordained plan for this child. Might change your life. Might be a little more difficult, but have a Manoah prayer. God, help me to order this child in the way that you have ordered it. Number three, why do we have abortions? We go off of the transportation unit. That's the person. Y'all understand what I mean by transportation unit, right? We go off of the transportation unit instead of the ordinance. So you're looking at him or her versus looking at him that gave you him or her. I'm going to end him or her because I'm looking at him or her. I'm trying to get you to look to him over his ordinances for him or her, despite how him or her is acting. Does that make sense? So how do, we, how, do we, how do we resist the trap of abortion? Point number one, sexual purity. You see that? Hmm. What about rape? It's 1%. I'm not minimizing it, but that's not the main cause of why people have abortions. Sexual purity. There are some situations you will never be in if you keep your zipper up. I'm not talking about the 1.7 and the 1% rarities that does happen. I'm talking about your part. Your part. Sexual purity is not a movement, it's a commandment. We have a sexual purity movement. It's a, com it's a commandment. <laughs> like, God's commandments aren't trying to make your life harder. They'll make your life better. Sex is not boarding an airplane and never coming back. Sex has been around from Genesis. The reason it's so hard is because it's the only sin that you could do later. Like you can't murder later. God's like, once you have sex in marriage, it's blessed. But if you're not married, don't do it. So it's something that you could do later. So it reveals the patient problem. Fruit of the spirit of patience. That's it. It's the patient issue. Love is patient. Sexual purity. Number two, how do we resist the trap of abortion? Have churches who restore publicly. 
restore publicly. This, I'm not naming the church, but the way, this, the way I saw this church handle a pastor whose scandal went public really bothered me. Because I'm like, okay, God, thank you, that'll never be me. But I'm just like, man, I wonder how many feet that person washed, how faithful they were for years. And you find out about his issue, delete every sermon he ever preached. Disown him as a pastor, stall another pastor, we move on. There's grace for the, for the chairs. There's not grace for the pulpit. <laughs> I could counsel you if something happens to you. If you find out about me, I'm gone. I had a doctor give me a prescription. I had a cold. This was like 2016. Could have been COVID. Didn't even know it. I had a cold. 2016, nose running just really. The doctor comes in there and says, yeah, <coughs> you want to take these? Three days, you can go to your Walgreens, they'll give you another prescription. This sick doctor's giving me a prescription. True story. I still took it. Still took it, and I got better. I just wonder, how is it I could see an obvious cold in this dude, listen to his instructions, but if you see an obvious cold in somebody else, okay, see, y'all don't want to talk to me. What if the church restored more publicly? We throw people away more publicly. But what if we had more public outreaches and scenarios where we see churches who have the love of Jesus? What about sin? If you, have y'all noticed Jesus' ministry? People ran to him with issues? Yeah. My child has a demon. <laughs> Some would be scared to say, my child has a demon. I have leprosy. Jesus, son of David. What was it about Jesus' ministry that people didn't care that they needed healing to where today we hide? Could it be we've become more business-like than Christ-like? Yeah. Yeah. Study Jesus' ministry. They would rip open roofs to expose their issues. We hired ours. Have churches who restore publicly. I'm not minimizing sin. All I'm suggesting is he who is without sin, cast the first stone. Number three, remember the child was ordained before you were pregnant. Before you take this, remember... Before this child was in your womb, God already had a plan for him or her. Number four, trust for God to be Jehovah Jireh. Many of us are considering abortion because you don't believe that God is Jehovah Jireh, your provider. I messed up though, he's still gonna provide. I want to prove it to you. Uh, Genesis chapter 17, verse 19, it says, this is God speaking to Abraham about Ishmael because God still loves Ishmael. Even though Isaac was the one that was done right, God still loves Ishmael. Look at this. Genesis chapter 17, verse 19. Verse 20, excuse me, sorry. And it says, as for Ishmael, I have heard you. I will bless, I will surely bless him. I will make him fruitful and will greatly increase his numbers. He will be the father of the 12 rulers, and I will make him into a great nation. Who is Ishmael? Abraham's, oops, Abraham's lack of patience. What if we remember God cares for Ishmael too? So good, y'all. I made a mistake. He's Jehovah Jireh, and he cares for Ishmael too, has a plan for Ishmael too. Wasn't done in my original plan, but I still have a plan for Ishmael, and I'm going to make him a great nation, and I'm going to raise him, and he's going to be a ruler. But God, he's not Isaac. I still got plans for him. Maybe we commit abortions because we don't trust for God to be Jehovah Jireh. The last point, number five, how do we 
stop the trap of abortion. Remember, your body's not yours. Your body's not yours. I was told by my bride, you preach boldly and God will give you the grace to say what it is that he wants you to say. Let the chips fall where they may. But now we're accountable. How does God view it? Murder. I have an ordained plan for that child. And if I'm going to be your God, if I'm going to be your Savior, then you've been bought with a price. And your life is not yours and your body is not yours. Carl, put the ultrasound back. Thank you. This type of teaching hurts, stings, but him or her, I gotta be so grateful for it. I made a vow to God. I didn't ask for this. I didn't ask for this. Usually any person who's truly called doesn't want to do this. I asked my mom and my dad. I said, I'm never going to be a pastor. When I'm at your house, I'm done with church. Say it, Tisha. I said, I'm never going to do it. I tried to do my own thing tried to live my own way train up a child in the way that he should go and when he is old he will not depart from it so I felt that spiritual leash tugging on me in college I had a dream I don't think I ever shared this publicly I'll never forget I had a dream I was in my dorm freshman Texas Southern University and there was this grim reaper you know what a grim reaper looks like Never forget it. This grim reaper I saw was just slaughtering people. This was a dream I had, just shoot, just cutting people up, right? And it was terrifying to me. And the grim reaper came up to me and had this axe and was like, ding, yeah. ding. It couldn't hit me, right? I said, I hate you. You're going to save people. And I woke up. I said, Ma, I want to start a student ministry. True story. I want to start a student ministry. So in this moment, this ultrasound is going to save millions. I'm not doing this for a stage, y'all. I can care less about a follow because I never wanted this. So I'm not a slave to losing it because I never wanted it. So I can tell you the truth. In love, and so that we can have God's heart on this. There's no judgment. I'm just trying to save the unborn. I said, I said. So I want to pray. Understand this may not be a message that you expect it to hear. The message I'm going to do the following Sunday, I wanted to do today. God was like, no, this one. And I tried. I feel like it's a better title than everything. Stop listening to them. That's so much better than baby steps. That's what I want to do. I want to help people stop listening to toxic voices. Remember I told us about toxic friends? No, this is the one, baby steps. I don't want to do that one now. You're going to do that one. And I've learned this. Maybe I need to do it today to save that today. And I may never know. So, Father... We we thank you for your perspective. We thank you for your word, O oh Lord. Help us to have a Manoah type of perspective. How can we get in agreement with the order that you have for this child? Father, please forgive us for the 63 million 
ordained men and ordained women who are robbed of the ability to carry out their assignment. We leave this place free from condemnation because you recognize that we have a justification in you that we couldn't get under the law of Moses. So through the blood of Jesus, it's just as if we didn't do it. But an unusual prayer that I pray right now for every man or woman that is considering an abortion, I pray that this message will be fire to their soul. I pray that it will pierce their hearts to such a degree where they cancel the appointment. Thank you for the eight months of allowing me to see Tanisha carry our unborn son. Because I don't know if I could preach it with the same conviction if I didn't actually see my child developing in real time. I thank you for this word that it will be timeless. An enemy, hell, we remind you that you are a defeated foe. You cannot have our children. Thank you for every generational cycle breaker that will be born. I thank you for every priest that will be born, every prophet that will be born, every pastor that will be born, every president that will be born, every leader that will be born. I thank you that they'll be able to stand, just like I am one day, a former prefos, saying thank you for allowing me to have life. And with my life, I will save other lives by your power. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody who agrees with that prayer, would you shout in the room, amen. Amen. amen.